I now invite Chris Gopal Krishnan, co-founder of Infosys, and Professor Pradeep, Institute Professor IIT Madras, to launch the Sangam 2020 report and announce the exciting book project. Uh, thank you, Krishnan, and um, uh, it's an honor and privilege uh, to share the platform with uh, Professor Pradeep. Um, uh, you know the yeah. Um, you know, uh, first of all, let me start by uh, congratulating uh, uh, Subha Kumar, Krishnan, Sri Siram, uh, and uh, the entire organizing team for uh, Sankam 2020. Uh, as uh, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy now just said, uh, you know, you have all, uh, uh, you know, taken uh, the challenge head on and uh, created a a much better program, um, much broader program, uh, much better attended program, and and uh, you know what what has been a challenge has been translated into actually an opportunity, and and as usual, um, you know IIT Ma uh, you know starts off uh, Sangam with um, a report, and this year. Uh, the, the, the report is a survey about uh, perception about the new normal. And, uh, and it's not surprising that 82% uh, uh, of the respondents are very or fairly confident that we will drive a new normal in the next few years. 80% of the respondents believe that the current state of rapid digitization that we are experiencing in our lives will become permanent. And Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy alluded to uh, these actually in his um, remarks. Uh, our dependence and our belief in science and technology to make our lives better has been also reinforced uh, by the report. Uh, you know, in, during the pandemic, um, it's been uh, uh, amazing to see the speed at which um, uh, science has moved in terms of trying to understand uh, the virus trying to figure out um, cures uh, for this uh, uh, vaccine. You know, we have in a very short period, record period of time, you know, three vaccines which are already uh, at the stage of, um, uh, you know, being uh, used and uh, probably another five, six uh, vaccines uh, coming uh, uh, online soon, uh, which is again unprecedented actually. So clearly, you know, uh, this uh, uh, perception uh, study is very important. Resilience is what is coming through. Uh, I am also confident that we will emerge uh, out of this stronger. Uh, of course, we need to uh, think about um, you know, the people who are less privileged, who actually cannot participate in the uh, digital life. Um, uh, don't have the connectivity and things like that. We couldn't actually work from home. Uh, I think that um, uh, concern, uh, I think, is also very important to keep in mind. And I'm confident that, you know, people did come, come forward to help these people. And I think that uh, will also um, continue. So it's uh, my uh, um, privilege, along with uh, Professor Pratip, to launch the report uh, the report is available at iitma.org website. And um, I think the screen is being shared. Yes, uh, this is the report. Uh, um, do you want to scroll down a little bit uh, so people can see that it's a real report? Or is it just a background? Yeah, this is the front page. The full front. report is available on iitmar.org. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I, I just want to, uh, you know, say a couple of more things, actually. Uh, you know, Professor uh, Bhaskar Ramurthy talked about resilience and uh, the opportunity uh, a crisis provides. See, crisis, technology disruptions, these are all events that will transform our normal lives. And we have seen this um, you know, with the introduction of digital computer. We have seen this with um, the financial crisis of 2008. Um, uh, this one, of course, is uh, more global, affects every country, every individual. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I don't think anybody uh, in our lifetime has experienced where people 
across the world had to stay at home businesses came to uh, sl- you know slow down significantly etc and and uh, uh, you know um, as is being reflected in the report uh, you know acceleration of digitization dependence on science and technology belief that science and technology can help uh, are things which i think got reinforced and this is what i believe is an opportunity for um, us here in india we are at a disruptive moment in uh, our um, lifetime uh, i strongly believe that um, you know not just this crisis but the introduction of the technology to the fourth industrial revolution uh, will allow new businesses to emerge new leadership to emerge new entrepreneurship entrepreneurs to emerge new startups to emerge and also uh, new uh competitive economies to emerge see 20th century is seen as the century of us whereas i believe that the 21st century could actually become a century for india uh you know it's driven by uh, knowledge it's driven by intelligence and since we have large number of people we have a good education system we can take advantage of this and make this india's century in a lifetime transformation is possible that is what i have learned from my experience with the it services industry we were able to create a world class industry out of india 191 billion dollars 4 million people employed world class companies out of india and and when i look at uh, you know the top 5 companies in the world in terms of market in us in terms of market cap they are all uh, companies which are less than 50 years old and us transformed itself in 100 years at the beginning of the 20th century us was a small economy compared to europe but in 100 years they have become the largest economy in the world about 19 20% of the global gdp so such transformations are possible uh, in our lifetime and when i look when i look at a century and that is what i believe we need to uh, make happen and 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 uh, you know um the confidence is very high when i talk to uh, students when i talk to youth uh, they believe that they can transform the world i think they need to work hard they need to work smart they need to work intelligently they need to invest in ipr they need to invest in research innovation uh, become entrepreneurs and if they do that i believe strongly that this century can be india's century now i will pass on to professor pratip for his uh, perspectives and uh, talk about the book project also thank you for this invitation uh, to speak here thank you chris thank you krishnan thank you iit ma india 2030 and beyond through the eyes of scientists and engineers is a book that iit ma has taken up under my leadership we wish to complete the project by march 2021 we embarked on it nearly a year ago but it got momentum only in the past 4 months due to various reasons we have formed a 16 member team comprising of some of the leading researchers and business leaders in india and outside to guide the project we have taken the services of professionals to collect data and write this in the form of a readable common man's document objective of the project is to place before the nation our thoughts as to what india should be from the eyes of practicing scientists and engineers the reports about india's future have been many several visionary documents have appeared in the past but none of them captured the vision by practicing scientists and engineers in fact we would like to capture that by the soldiers themselves while this will be a, a book and it will be published it will also be a living document so that it can be improved continuously let us take a birds eye view 
of the issues SNT are facing, SNT enterprises facing. Taking a brief look into history may be appropriate here. It is, of course, a view from 3,000 or 30,000 uh, feet from above. India was the only colonized nation to have developed some scientific capability at the time of independence. It had very few good institutions and scientists. Private industry was just taking baby steps in 1947. There were no equipment manufacturers, no technology industry. There were no funding mechanisms for science. Structured science was impossible. Indian political leaders and intelligentsia were eager to develop the nation quickly by developing a competitive industry. India had a serious shortage of skilled people, all the way from technicians to researchers. The Sarkar Committee was set up in 1945 to examine ways of setting up top-notch engineering institutions. Following this set of recommendations, five IITs were established by 1961. Fast forward, IITs have become important institutions of research, while research in universities shrunk to the lowest levels. India currently spends only 0.8% of its GDP on research, almost nearly constant for the past several tens of years. In comparison, China spends 2% of its GDP on research and USA spends 2.7%. Compared to our success in some strategic domains that we celebrate today, India still needs to catch up in other important technologies impacting the lives of its citizens. Catching up really means a lot. Indian electronics imports are likely to touch about uh, US dollars 400 billion by 2020. Our recent electronics policy forecasts a domestic electronics production of uh, 400 billion dollars in 2025 when the demand is likely to be much higher. India has to invest heavily in research. Let us face it, without funding, there is no science of quality. Without a mechanism to fund science, Indian researchers struggled to tackle problems that were ambitious and globally competitive. The pandemic has indeed exposed a huge vacuum we have in all these areas. I leave it to you to think about them. For long, India thought that science and technology was just needed. But it has to understand that science and technology is essential. Look at this. A deeper understanding of science by the society in totality would have by and large solved the tremendous impact of the pandemic. And that understanding has to happen in all strata of society. Looking at it holistically, the enormous impact of engineering education in a way brought down the growth of humanities. This is my view. Without good English, we are not learning, not learning well. We must realize that all aspects of human endeavor are important in that vision Chris talked about. The first four decades after independence were an era of foundation building of, for Indian science and engineering. National laboratories largely struck to solving simple problems and translational research was at a very low level. The IITs functioned as teaching institutions with low numbers of PhD students and low levels of research. 
India rapidly increased its investment in R&D. New institutions increase the depth and breadth of research in India. We have now over 930 universities, a jump of three times in 10 years. In science, we are having a situation of surplus production of PhDs. While numbers are growing, quality is a serious concern. Indian science and technology <clears throat> is growing quickly, but not quickly enough in comparison to the other developing nations nearby. China and Korea were at the same place in 1980, but have left India far behind. In 1980s, when China became, well, a liberalized society by and large, Deng Xiaoping decided to grow the economy through R&D investment. When India got itself liberalized in 1990s, its leaders did not envisage economic growth through R&D investments. Three decades of high investments have positioned China as a world leader in strategic technologies of the future. India would need sustained high investments, apart from good policies, to be able to compete globally. India has the second largest number of STEM graduates in the world at 2.6 million, next only to China at 4.7 million. So this human capability is our asset if we can direct it. India continues to be a society of contradictions. Every problem exists here, good for engineers. For India to grow, it needs, I mean, I would say that it is necessary that it stays as a strong democracy. With all the foundations of democratic institutions protected, legislator, judiciary, secularism, freedom of expression, and our autonomous institutions. We may agree or disagree, but the fact is that only in open democracies, science and technology has flourished. Secondly, science and technology will depend upon the existence of peace in the region. Thirdly, the greater India has to be together. Inequality that prevails, that was evident in the exodus of migrant workers during lockdown, is a threat that looms large on India. Threat to institutions come from the power of money and corruption. Unless India cleans it, we will not be liberated. Digital India can make a big change, but that alone is not enough. I take you to Ambedkar. He said in his famous speech of 1925, uh, 1949, November 25th, that famous speech in the Constituent Assembly, I quote, on the 26th January 1950, we are going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we have equality and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote and one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. How long shall we continue to live like this life of contradictions? How long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and economic life? If we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting our political democracy in peril. We must remove this contradiction at the earliest possible moment or India will suffer. I, there are a few more sentences, I leave that here. I feel that it is important that we understood the importance of these statements. The critical aspect is that we will have all these planning for science and technology only if India is together. That India should include all, not only IITX. 
in today's world, it must include biodiversity in every sense, not only the human DNA. We must realize that at the level of human genome, Indians are from everywhere else. And 60% of the human genome by itself is that of the common fruit fly. We need to be sensitive to these issues when we look forward to India 2030. Jai Hind, in fact. Dhaniwad and thank you. Thank you, Chris and uh, Professor Pradeep for those uh, inspiring words. Uh, Lata, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pradeep and uh, our, our dear Chris Gopal Krishnan, who has been a great, uh, uh, great support to IIT Ma for all your advice and all the, uh, you know, your gestures that has helped us move to where we are today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, please note that IIT Madras Alumni Association uh, will be conducting uh, Bharat Pass, which is a Bharat Public Attitude to Science Survey every year. And uh, we hope to come up with some good study and uh, something uh, more that could be more value to our, our country. Thank you so much.